All right. Uh, I think we're probably just going to start a little early because we have a pretty good crowd in here. Um, so uh, this artist, um, uh, excuse me. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jabari Owens Bailey. I work here at the museum as uh, education program manager. Um, and uh, Chris Day uh, is uh, here as part of our uh, Black History Month uh, event. Um, he is an artist from the UK. Um, he identifies as biracial and he uses uh, craft to navigate what it means to be black in the UK uh, and also white. Uh, and his work borrows uh, qualities that, um, from the qualities that make glass seductive and comment on issues of race uh, with narratives that range from uh, uh, complex inquiries to unflinching social vignettes. Um, and Day makes uh, objects that are more than racially defined, reflecting multiple dimensions of identity and experience. Uh, and his work is going to be featured in an upcoming exhibition uh, that I'm curating here at the museum uh, titled A Two-Way Mirror, uh, Double Consciousness in Contemporary Glass by Black Artists. Uh, and that will be opening uh, this fall in October and it'll run from October 2023 to October 2024. Um, and that work, uh, that uh, exhibition deals with uh, black artists who are using glass as a means of exploring uh, issues of identity and race uh, and also a uh, history of uh, black bodies being rendered in glass. Uh, and so uh, Chris Day actually um, is our first artist that has come to do a residency that's a part of a two-way mirror and we're so happy to have him here. And so I'm just going to get out the way and let him uh, talk about his work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so where do I begin? Six years ago, I'm a plumbing and heating engineer by trade. And my wife said to me, you've got to go to university. And when she says you've got to go, I've got to go. So that's what I did. But I didn't know, all my life I've struggled reading and writing, and I knew if I go to university, I've got to, I've got to trace all these barriers and get across them. So I didn't want to go at all. But when I did go, for me, I thought education was about learning and getting intelligence. So I've called this emotional intelligence, because when I went there, that's all it was about for me. It was finding things and stories that were very emotional and I wanted to express that in my work. So that's what I've tried to do. But while at university, trying to search for other artists of color that were doing glass, it was impossible. So this is a search. This is a Bing search, and I put in black glass artists. And that's what come up, black glass. <laughs> Not a single artist on it. And then, and then you ask your tutors and the lecturers, do you know any people of colour that are doing glass? Anything? And they said, yeah, there was perhaps one a couple of weeks or a couple of years ago, but there was absolutely nobody out there. Since then, I've done it again, and there I am, along with other black glass artists. But this is only because I got noticed and people started to support me. I haven't got here by myself. There's been a lot of support along the way. So as I was looking for black artists of color that were doing glass, nobody came up on that search engine. So then I started to look for other artists and I came across Kara Walker. Very explicit, some of her pictures. And I didn't want to be like that. I didn't want to scare people away, but I wanted to tell the stories. I was intrigued by everything that I was learning at university and I wanted to put that across because if I can get mo emotional about them, I was hoping I could make other people emotional. But that's all I could find was Kara Walker and this guy, Fred Wilson. I owe me being here to him because he influenced me so much in his work and how he actually engaged with an audience. For me, it's not about showing off how good I am as a glass artist. It's about this conversation which we can all have and this interaction with people. Just normal people like me as a plumbing and eating engineer. I didn't want to talk to the lecturers. They know too much. 
But what I wanted to do is tell people the story that I've got and the stories that were hidden. So Fred Wilson, this is what the stories he was telling about black people and how they were characterized and taken the mickey of. And, you know, it's bad over here. I feel scared being in America, actually. You know, racism in the UK is quite polite, but over here it's, uh, yeah, it's in your face, you know. So for me, yeah, being here is, yeah, what a journey. So this is what I was searching and this is what was coming up. I didn't know anything about Fred Wilson. I didn't know anything about Emmett Till's or George Stinney's. I knew absolutely nothing. And the reason I knew nothing was because we didn't have Black History Month. We didn't have Black History Week. We didn't even have Black History Hour. We had no Black History whatsoever. You know, so as a teenager, I knew nothing about my heritage at all. So when you see people like Fred Wilson and what he was trying to say, but the way he was saying it was, it would make people smile when they seen his work. And that's what intrigued me was that I looked at his work and I thought, that's funny. Then I wanted to find out more. That's where looking at images helped me. Being dyslexic, I didn't want to do lots of reading, but it was the images that made me so emotional. We had the same in Britain. So we had this, you know, we had this on the TVs in the 70s and the 80s. We had, you know, uh, we had, yeah, racism about Indians, families fighting. It was never portrayed as a good thing. So this is Fred Wilson's work. This is the first piece of work I've seen. And most artists will say that they're influenced by something. And I think that I'm influenced by images. I've got this catalog of images in my head that just get slotted somewhere and then I'll use them. Sometimes I'm making work and I don't know anything about what I'm producing, but somewhere in there, there's something that just spurs me on. It's not just images. So Billie Holiday's record, Strange Fruit. I grew up that with UB40's renditions in the 1980s. It's a quite reggae based kind of thing, but I wasn't listening to the words. I was just listening to the tune and I thought that's cool because I had that young head on my shoulders. But as soon as I went to university and I was Googling things, Strange Fruit came up and I listened to Billie Holiday's words, not the tune, and it made me stop and shudder. So this is, what we've, this is what strange fruit is. It's not your everyday thing that you want to see hanging off a tree, but this is what got me. And I had to make a piece of work to get it out my system. It wasn't a matter of talking to an audience at that stage because I didn't have an audience. I only had my college students and the professors to talk to. I didn't have this. But the thing that really got me is how somebody of such a young age can look at this and not be affected. As soon as I look at it, wow, how can you not be affected? But for me, that was, that, that's how it was. That's how society was back then. So that's my strange fruit. So you can see the influence from Fred Wilson, how he had these, this piece of glass that was dripping down. And I produced this. But it was only in a later time, once I look back and I reflect, and I look back at Fred Wilson's work, is that, yeah, you definitely influenced me. And this is the saddest story I ever came across. I never heard, I never heard of Emmett Till six years ago, and I'm ashamed. But why should I be ashamed? Because I've never been taught it. But as soon as I, and like I said, I didn't read the story, I looked at the images. So as soon as see this beautiful face with his mum, Gorgeous, I've got a young kid, nine years old, only a couple of years younger than him. But it was the strength his mum had that was the birth of the civil rights movement and her strength, what they did to their son was unbelievable. This is what they did. So you've got a beautiful boy and then they turn him into this. But like I say, she was strong. I don't think I could be that strong if that was my child. So to get past that, I had to produce a piece of work to get it out of my system. Not to, I didn't have this. I didn't have an audience to tell his story, but I needed to produce a piece of work to tell it and get it out of me because I was so emotional about it. In fact, the next day after I'd seen all these images, I went to university 
And at my desk, the lecturer came and I had this big bowl on my desk. And he says, Chris, what's that about? And it had blood all over it. And I said, Max. And that's all I got out. I just burst into tears. Because all them images that I'd seen at the weekend had affected me that much, but I'd hidden the stories that I wanted to tell him at that time that I wonder how big a bowl I'd have to produce to carry the tears of the mums and the fathers and the dads and the brothers and the sisters that have cried because their loved ones have been brutally abused just because of the colour of the skin. But I couldn't get that out. I just cried. And at that moment, I knew if I wanted to tell his story, I've got to be strong, just like his mum. And so I dedicated to his mum. And it's now in the v &A Museum in England, one of the biggest museums there. Thank you. But that clapping's not for me, it's for Emmett. That story would have never have got into that British Museum if it wasn't for him. So all that, I'm not bothered that I'm, I'm in there, I'm bothered that Emmett's in there, and that story now is being told, the story that I didn't know. So another piece that's in a museum, Back to Black. As I say, I didn't get taught about anything about my heritage, any of the artists. So you'd have thought, going to an art school in England, they'd at least tell me about some black artists that have gone through it. Nothing. So in 1963, we got demonstrations, you know, and, and my lecturers were saying, it happened a long time ago. Why can't you celebrate being black or something that's, that's good? And I'm thinking, well, this is in my lifetime. I was born in 1968, so this is only five years away. So it's still fresh, and it has never been talked about. In 1981, when I was just a, a youth, you know, we had riots going on in England, left, right, and center. And even today, we've still got it. So spot the difference. There's no difference. We have not got that conversation yet, and we have not spoken and talked about it. We just keep putting sticky plasters over the wounds. So like I say, when I was at university, all these artists that I've listed actually went to the same university as me. And you had the BAMS movement in the US, which is the black art movement, and at that time, they decided to have the BLK art group. And they were doing exactly the same. In their artwork, they were demonstrating about what was happening in society. This is what I grew up with. This was what was on my streets daily. We were being spat on. We was being called all sorts of words. I was getting into lots of fights. But this is, this is what we had to put up with. It's nowhere near what America's gone through, but we had this on a daily basis. So when I see this flag, it makes me laugh because I've seen this on the walls and it's supposed to have scared me. But when I seen this, I thought, that's awesome. It's made this symbol that I was scared of into a symbol that I love as an art piece because it's trying to, it's trying to break down that barrier and trying to make people aware of what Britain is actually about, but it's trying to get rid of it as well at the same time. Britain is changing, just like the USA, hopefully, but it's only changing because of one person, George Floyd. Would I be here if it wasn't for George Floyd? Like I say, my wife told me to go to university, which is one thing. George Floyd's death, is another thing. Being headhunted by the biggest gallery in London is the third thing. But if you take either of them things out, I wouldn't be here. So Harewood House, they contacted me. I was driving down to London one day, and they says, we want you to do an exhibition in the church. And that's another sticky one for me, is the church. You've got an establishment that had its pocket in slavery just like the royal family, just like the banks, just like anybody. Even a plumbing and heating engineer could put a share into a slave in them days. So when they said, we want to put it in the church, I says, that's an ideal spot. I can talk 
and tell them the stories of how the church had their fingers in the pie. So Harewood House found, I think it's 28 bottles in the cellars that were produced during the slave trade, and they sold them at auction. All the funds went to different charities, which was great. But I didn't know anything about Harewood House. It's not on my doorstep. I didn't know the involvement of slavery. And that's the problem, is that everybody in England and how it's been established is on the backs of slavery, but it's, it's all hidden. It's this hidden lie that's out there. And the, in the history books, they change it for the best. You don't see all the badness. I went down to the British Museum looking for something about the transatlantic slave trade. Nothing in there whatsoever. So I asked one of the curators, have you got anything? She pointed for me to the Greek and the Roman artifacts. Nothing against, nothing about the trans trade. So I even got in the Financial Times. <laughs> but I'm always image-based. So these colors, I'd seen this slave ship going through all the uh, research that I was doing, and I was haunted by the different colors. That's all. The imagery that's in there, it's very subjective. And I think that's what I try and do with my work. I make it subjective, so it's not quite there, but it is. Looking at images of the plantations and the people working on it. Tilling the fields. You know, these people couldn't have a day off. They were working nine till five, even seven till 10, whatever. They didn't have a single hour. And the one day they did have, they had to go to church. So as I've said, I've called this emotional intelligence. And even through my drawings, I put so much emotion in there trying to get it out. So I produced this piece of work on the left-hand side way before Harewood House had got in contact with me. But it looks like a H. There's something up there telling me about what's gonna come. But what this was actually about was how they've lynched people. So on the left-hand side, it's supposed to be an electric chair where they executed George Stinney, 14-year-old boy, supposed to have raped three girls, didn't do it. And then on the right-hand side, you've got Emmett Till, who was tied to a tree and brutalized. So this is the work I produced for Harewood House. It's called Under the Influence, because at that time, everybody was under the influence that slavery was a good thing, including the church. But the thing is, if the church condones it, then everybody's gonna say, yeah, it's good, man. We'll have a piece of that. The hardest thing for me was trying to make it humanized. Luckily enough, one of my students walked past one day and I said, stop, stop. And that was it. There's her hair and it's capped the top of the bottle. If I'd have put a piece of copper on there or a cork stop, it wouldn't have told the same story. And that's what we ended up to. That's in the church. There was 28 bottles of them to represent the 28 bottles that they found. But for me, I don't want to put barriers up. I want to have a conversation. I would love to know what this lady is thinking when she's looking at these bottles. Is she just looking, the, admiring the colors? Does she know the story? But for me, she's engaging, and that's the most important thing. Same with these two. Looks like they've just been shopping, but they're there, they're looking at the exhibition, and they're taking it in. And I was there. I had strange fruit in 2019 hanging, and it scared people away. I had this in 2022, it scared people away. And then we come to COVID. So at 5 p.m. every Sunday, we had to stand on our doorsteps and clap for the NHS, which was brilliant. They did a good job. These were the people we were clapping for. But this is the people they showed. We've got migrant crisis, just like America has. But most of the migrants in that hospital had come from a migrant or an ethnic background. So for me, it was like, which ones do you want to let in? You think they're all rapists and they're going to steal all your money? But some of them are doctors and lawyers, perhaps even plumbing and heating engineers. But they're defined by what we see on the TV and what we see on social media. 
Look at this one. All refugees are welcome. What about the Syrian ones? What about the Afghanistan ones? What about them that came before the Ukraine? It disturbed me when I seen the news reports. One of the reporters says, it shouldn't happen. They're like us. Why shouldn't it happen to you? We're all humans. And then they were stopping people of color at the borders and letting the white people through first and telling them to wait till all the white people have gone through. You know, which ones do you let in? Which ones do you keep out? So I produced this piece of work. My tutors told me, when are you going to celebrate? And this piece of work was supposed to celebrate the migrants that have come to the UK and lifted it up. The people that come during Windrush and supported England after the war. The doctors, the nurses, anybody. And then the Ukraine crisis came. And I phoned up the people that commissioned me and I said, I've got to change the story. There's a bigger story than a celebration at the moment. So I produced this. You know, you've got rebar. You've got concrete. The rebar and the concrete is tied together and it's got bullet holes in it. You've got chains of slavery and ropes. And it's supposed to be a boat. Some people say it might be a big caterpillar, but I'm not bothered what people think as long as they're intrigued of the shape and they engage with a conversation. I don't want to scare people away. It's time for a proper conversation. Like I say again, I'd love to know what she's thinking when she looks at it. She knows the story by then. But she looks sad. She didn't look happy. But I wouldn't be here. Them three things that I said, my wife telling me to go to university, George Floyd, and this guy. This is the only reason I'm here, because he was brave enough to say, I'm going to give you a chance when everybody else was scared. But what it's given me is something that gets me really emotional. So being mixed race, I grew up with no father. In 1968, my mum became pregnant and my mum's brothers decided to beat up the first black bloke they found. Not, in my, not even my own family wanted me to be here. My granddad on his deathbed decided to tell my mum that bringing Chris Day into the world was the worst thing you've ever done to the family at the hospital. So on the left hand side, it looks like three nuns. So my mum had to go to a different hospital. And they told her to take a wedding ring off. She didn't have a wedding ring, but they made her take this ring off. So for me, this is me facing my own demons. Six years ago, I wouldn't have told you any of this. But art has given me the strength to tell other people's stories. And now it's time to tell my story. The stigma that's attached of being mixed race in the UK is terrible. Or it was terrible, it's not so bad now. And even in America, in 1967, they only changed the rules where interrelationships was now not illegal. You can do whatever you want. So what this is, this is this body of work. It's called colorblind. Myself being blind to it, and society being blind to it. The one on the, the picture on the left hand side is called the King and Queen. And this is supposed to be my mum and dad. They were supposed to be strong for me, but there wasn't. So I've hid the faces in this veil you know, society made them where they wasn't strong enough. But I'm just hoping I'm strong enough so I can influence somebody else to tell their story. And there we go. I made these in England. But they're nowhere as big as what's been produced here. And I don't think anybody will understand the journey that I've been on to get here has been hard. And I'm so privileged and thankful for the whole the whole journey I've been on. And that's it. You know, this guy, whatever matters, 
you've just got to shout out and say something about it. Thank you. Well, Chris has a brilliant story um, that, much like his work, is about uh, beauty struggling against what's on the outside. Uh, I think that just like the glass struggles against the copper, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, we wanted to take a, a chance to uh, have a little Q and A, uh, so people can ask some questions of Chris. Um, and he can talk about his work or any questions that you all might have. Um, well, I'm going to start off by asking a question. Um, so I know that you are a heating and plumbing engineer. And uh, the other night, despite me being from here and you being from England, we were walking around Home Depot, and you were more comfortable in there than I was because you just like know your way around all of the, all of the materials. Um, but it made me think uh, that, you know, like you said, this is all about telling your story. And so the thing that is binding the, the actual glass itself are uh, copper tubing. And that's something that you use actually in your profession. Uh, so can you speak to how the materials themselves have to do with your own narrative in, in so many different ways? Well, that's an easy one. So when I went to university, obviously, it's a place that I didn't feel comfortable in. So I wanted to tell my story as a plumbing and heating engineer, and this is my comfort blanket. I can work this all day. So I'm using a material that just says, you know what, we'll be all right. It was my, so it was my way of something holding my hand because I was in an environment I was scared to death to be in. When I started to use the copper, I wanted to tell the story of a plumbing and heating engine of finding the, the residues of the erosion that happens. But as soon as I blew glass into these structures, which were nothing like these, they were just basic, just round structures, it was giving me the vocabulary, with, especially with the dyslexia, I could stand in front of a lecturer and it would tell me, I could see what it's trying to do. It's trying to break through, it's fragile. You know, it's restrained, you've got a cage. So I'd already got this dictionary of words which I could just dip into. So that's why I use copper. The glass, obviously, I didn't start off as a glass artist. I did ceramics as well. But when you put clay onto a potter's wheel, it'll just sit there all day and not do anything. But as soon as you go into that furnace and gather, as soon as you pull it out, especially when you don't know what you're doing, it's gonna fall on the floor. But at that time, as a newbie, that action of it falling onto the floor, just like what Drip Drop Plot did and what Strange Fruit did, it's there, it's trying to escape. It's giving me this language and it's, it, the, the glass is doing the work for me. You know, you've seen the demonstrations. I'm not gonna stand, sit here and do five hours in the chair and make pretty things. You know, I want to engage with people and the story is the important thing. I could have an orange on there as long as it would create a conversation. And that's the most important thing is the conversation for me. All right, that's great. Um, we have a question. Could you describe your creative process from, did you start with a drawing and then, okay. So my lecturers used to hound me is that being an engineer is that I've got a I can see a problem and I'll fix it. I don't want to go through all that writing and drawing things and you know think this is what I'm going to create. I could never draw that because I don't know what's going to come out of these cages. So for me, my sketchbook was me going into the studio, doing these cages and blowing into them. So I says to him, I says, this is my sketchbook. He says, yeah, but to get your degree, you've actually do some, you've got to do some sketching as work uh, as well. So, yeah, my creative process is I get a bunch of copper and I just start to bind it up and I'll see what happens when I blow into it because I love it. It's like Christmas Day. I do not know. You can see they're all different. 
And even this process, you think, oh, he's going to get bored of it, but there's no way we can get bored because everyone that we do is going to be different. Even if I did the cage the same, the heat that's in the glass and how it's going to cool and how we blow, it just comes out. So my creative po uh, way to do things is that I just experiment. Sometimes there's a story and sometimes there isn't. Sometimes I've got to wait for the right moment. It's took me 55 years to produce this piece of work. So that creative is just like, it's just, yeah, it's onward and going. All right. Um, does anybody else have any questions? All right. Okay, so let's re rewind. 16, I am. I wanted to go to art college. My teacher says, you've got to do maths and English. So that art college didn't happen. So from 16, although I was very artistic at the time, is that my first few jobs, I did a sign writing job. I worked in a sign shop. Um, I worked for an illustration company. It's called Derbyshire Life magazine. And I just used to do little illustrations, but it was just part-time, there was nothing full-time. Then I went to work in a factory. I went to work in just running an oven. So how your biscuits are made, they go through an oven. And I was at the end and I was making sure they were baked. So I just had normal jobs. Then I went into engineering, but I went through the back door. Being dyslexic, I didn't have any exams at the time. So I worked in a storeroom, just giving out the parts. But at night time, I could go on the machines and make things. Even though I'd never been trained to go on these machines, I knew what I could do. I used to take engines apart and pull them back together without even knowing or having a book in front of me. The, electric, the, the electrician, the head of le electrics, headhunted me. He phoned me up one day and he said, Chris, he says, I've got a job for you. And I thought he wants me to go and work in his warehouse store. He says, but I want you to work on robots. Without swearing, I said, what the, do I know about robots? He says, it's not what you know, it's what you can do. And I worked in the research and development into these robots. After six years, I was teaching the people that had been there for 20 odd years how to mend these things. But there was, I've always used these. So that creativeness has always been there. I've always messed, I've done engines, motorbikes, I've repaired cars. So I've always had to use these and I've enjoyed that. But it was only because my wife said, you've got to go to university that I thought, if I've got to go back to university, if I've got to go to university, I want to do something that I wanted to do when I was 16. So that was it. But when I went there, I had no portfolio of artwork. I'd not touched a pencil or a paint or anything. I went there thinking they'll say, no, no, we don't want you and I'll go back to plumbing and eating. And, you know, but it didn't happen. Another question? I'm gonna uh, talk the current body of work that you're doing, you're calling it colorblind. Um, anecdotally, I had a story about, um, I'm talking with some black students that I had and I'm a lesbian. And I told her, I said, you know, it's wonderful how you, know, you don't see color and you don't see, and I got a lot of pushback on that statement because they didn't like the fact that I said, I don't see color. Do you find that you're seeing that just as of yet? Any type of pushback because of that statement that you don't see color or being colorblind, you, you see everyone as human beings? I think it'd be nice, wouldn't it, if we could just see each other as human beings, because that's all we are, you know. Just because we've got a different shade of skin, it doesn't make us any different. When we bleed, we're all red. But the colour blindness isn't just a matter of, um, for me, the, the title colour blind is like I was trying to tell the story about my mum and dad, is that, you know, that's the blindness, is that, and society was blind. Um, when I'm with anybody, is that, I'll talk to somebody, just talk to them. It doesn't matter. So I haven't got no preference. I don't, 
I can't dip my toe into one society or another. I'm mixed race. So I've got no allegiance to anybody. But the problem is, and this is a, the other thing is why it's called colorblind, is when I'm walking down the street is that people can't see the whiteness inside of me. They can't see that other side. They just see this different shade of man walking down. And, but I've had to have all the stigma that's attached of being black. So that's the bit of, you know, that's the bit of colorblind. But I wish society would change. It's gonna take, it's gonna take forever. It's gonna take forever, unfortunately. It's not a quick fix, you know. We're still, we're still demonstrating, still calling it out. And now it's black on black, so where do we go? It's just, <laughs> it's just a hard, a hard one. And I think, I think for me over the last couple of years, it flatlined. We knew it was there, but now it's rose again. Trump hasn't helped, and what we've got in, uh, in the UK isn't helping with Brexit. It's just making that divide all the time. There's nobody really trying to bring us all together. Uh, I, I want to speak a little that a little bit too. I think it's, it's dangerous to say that you're colorblind. Uh, and I think this exhibition, and, and I think Chris meant colorblind tongue in cheek when he was talking about it. I, I think that this exhibition, uh, A Two Way Mirror, is about uh, exploring ideas of identity because they need to be talked about uh, without actually having a discussion and just being colorblind. Um, you're not really engaging with history and that makes history bound to repeat itself. And so I think it's important to actually uh, acknowledge the fact that there is difference and then go from there. So like I say, I, um, I did, so I was fresh out of university, done three years doing my BA. And then there was an exhibition at Starbridge. It's the Glass Biennale. And I had strange fruit hanging. The guy that discovered me, Angel, from Vessel Gallery in London, he's top of his game. There's only him down in London who's, who displays glass and he's, he's world renowned. I didn't even know who he was. So there's little me, three years out of uni, displaying in the first exhibition, real exhibition, where people are gonna see the work. And it's talking about lynching. Everybody was scared. He said I should have won it, but being a student, I couldn't win it. Could you imagine, you know, a student winning one of the biggest prizes in, in, uh, in Britain? But what he did, he gave me his card. And I looked at it, and I put it in my pocket. My friend next to me says, do you know who he is? I said, no, who is it? He? he says, it's Angel from Vessel Gallery. I says, what's Vessel Gallery? I didn't even know. I was, con I was concentrating on telling stories and my research. So I, I wasn't bothered about galleries. I didn't even think I could get into one. I wasn't, about, I, wasn't, I wasn't even bothered about other glassmakers because I was so focused. But when I did find out who he was, scared to death. To the point... I went to uni the next day or the next week and he says, have you contacted him? I says, no. <laughs> I say, he says, why not? I says, well, I, I just don't. He says, well, what are you going to lose? So I phoned him up and he says, come down. So I've gone to his gallery and in there, it's like looking at the museum collection. You've got glass artists that are top of the game. James Devereux. Elliot Walker, Catherine Schillings, these are all British artists that are really high-end, European artists. And I says to him, I says, does my work warrant being in this gallery? And he says, don't worry about that. I says, I says yeah, but what about the racism and the, the political bit? He says, oh, forget that. He says, it looks beautiful just on its own. Forget the story. He tried to reassure me because that's, that's what I needed because I had no confidence whatsoever. 
I, you might look at me now and think, wow, he's killing it out there, but it's took ages to get comfortable. But he gave me the, he gave me the confidence. And like I say, it was because of him. It wasn't because I was knocking on doors. He discovered me, but he, he was the key holder. He knew everybody. And then George Floyd happened. I was supposed to be having a solo exhibition. COVID was happening. And he says, we'll still put it up. People can see it online if they can't come into the, into the gallery. And I says to Angel at that time, I says, you know, we're both putting our heads above the parapet. One, because you're supporting an artist of color that will be deemed as political. And secondly, is because you're well-renowned in the art world. And although he's mixed as well, believe it or not, so he's Swiss and Spanish. So perhaps that's where we've got this allegiance. And I says, you're putting your head on the block with the art world because he's got all this beautiful glass and there's mine telling this story that's brutal. But he just same again, he reassured me, he says, don't worry about it. And he was right because everybody came out of the woodwork. All the museums, all the magazines, even in America. I forgot the list. My CV was this big when I started and now it's just pages and pages in six, in three years actually, of stuff that I've done. But this is all because of George Floyd. I'm here because of his legacy. So that's why I've got from there to here. Yeah. No problem. All right. Uh, well, thank you all so much for coming out to this talk. Oh, I'm sorry, we have a, a, a young person with a question. I always like to have young people ask questions. Okay, okay. See, that's a hard one. So for me... Yeah, so he, uh, the, the, the young gentleman asked me what was my favorite piece of glass I've ever made. How can I say that? How can I say that Emmett Till's more important than the work that I've got? This is very emotional to me. Every story is important, so every piece of glass is important. And yeah, I've got, I haven't got a favorite because they're just telling stories. So. It, yeah, I think for me, I, if, if I really had to choose one, I suppose it would be Emmett, because that's, that's the one that, that kicked it off for me, really, emotionally. Um, but then I've, I've done a piece of work about George Stinney. The work's not important, the story is. So for me, all the stories are important, and my work's just a way of people to get enticed into that. Hope that helps. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're going to take uh, one more question uh, before we head out. Um, okay. Um, what caused your wife to finally say, <laughs> almost as an ultimatum, you're going to school. So I told you the story about uh, the electrical engineer, and he was nice. He was, he was awesome. The people that have supported me along the way, they've been few, but they've been heartwhelming. So Mike, we used to go to his house for dinner, and afterwards, and there was this one phrase he said to my wife, he says, just think what Chris would have been if he'd have gone to university. And that's stuck in her head. <laughs> so that's why you're going to university and you're going to show them. And I didn't even, you know, I didn't want to go. I just wanted to go on that, on that opening day, say, I've got no credentials, see you later, and go, and go back to my plumbing. But I'm so glad they accepted me. This is that, 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 that girl up there. There you go, do you want the mic? When you were a kid, was school segregated? Okay, no, yeah. Um, 
No, it weren't as bad as here, so it wasn't segregated, but where I grew up, there was me and three others. So yeah, we were segregated, <laughs> but in a different way. You know, there was, um, it was rough. It was rough where I grew up. You call it the projects. We call it, um, yeah, we just call it low cost housing. So um, we banded together. Uh, there was lots of fights, lots of abuse. So we wasn't segregated, but society and the kids segregated us. So in a way, yeah, we was. But, you know, I had, I had friends around me that, that supported me. And it's just like this, you know, I've got a lot of friends. Friends I didn't even know I had. So it's been, yeah. But it wasn't as bad as what uh, America went through. Well, okay, uh, we, we have... Have you ever done it before? You're going to enjoy it. Enjoy it. That's the first one. Enjoy it. Everything's going to be enjoyable. You're going to make loads of mistakes. Every day I, I started, I made a mistake. I'm still making mistakes today. You know, these glass blowers here, they get taught from an early age and they're into it. I started at 48. So, but what I've done is I've enjoyed every single minute. When that drips on the floor, I enjoyed that. You know, so all I can say is just enjoy it. You're gonna um, just keep doing it. It's like anything. We didn't, we didn't come out the womb walking. We had to keep falling down. And that's what's gonna happen. You're gonna keep falling down, but you're gonna get back up until you do it. And you don't have to follow the, everybody else's way of doing it. Find your own way. You know, people have told me to stop blowing into these cages a long time ago, but I love, I love what I do. I enjoy it and that's it. I'm not here to show off, I'm just enjoy every single moment I blow into one of these. So get, your, get whatever you do and just enjoy it. All right. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us. Uh, I think we're going to start um, blowing glass again at, it's about two, a little after two? Okay, so our team is going to be back a little after two. Uh, thank you all so much for coming to the lecture. And uh, remember this October, the exhibition that Chris is going to be a part of, uh, A Two-Way Mirror, uh, Double Consciousness in Contemporary uh, Glass by Black Artists is going to be opening here at uh, Museum of Glass. Uh, and so that will be, um, it would be great if you all are able to come out and uh, see the exhibition. Uh, again, thank you all so much. <laughs>